Welcome, thank you for coming. This is the fifth in a series of talks on the fundamentals of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy in Savitri. So each of the talks have focused on a central issue in Sri Aurobindo's spiritual philosophy and examined how it has been described in both his prose writings and in Savitri. The prose writings give a more intellectual account of the issue, while Savitri provides a more intuitive and spiritual expression, often in mantra, a revelation in words issuing directly from the higher consciousness. Earlier talks in the series examined Sri Aurobindo's conception of the Brahman, or divine, the processes of involution and evolution, the psychic being, or soul personality, and the processes of karma, fate, and free will. And these talks have been made available on YouTube on the Savitri Bhavan channel and are also available as papers in the Savitri Bhavan library. The present talk focuses on the problem of error, falsehood, and evil. Their nature, how they came into existence in a world created by the divine, for what reason they are allowed to continue, and how they may be overcome. I begin with the questions of how and why they came into being, as described in a long letter of Sri Aurobindo's that was published in a book, booklet called The Riddle of This World, and is included in Letters on Yoga One. The portion I'll read begins on page 256 of Letters on Yoga One, and I'll read it in several parts, briefly commenting on each. For to the how of the fall into the ignorance, as opposed to the why, as to the effective cause, there is a substantial agreement in all spiritual experience. It is the division, the separation, the principle of isolation from the permanent and one that brought it about. It is because the ego set up for itself in the world affirming its own desire and self-affirmation in preference to its unity with the divine and its oneness with all. It is because instead of the one supreme force, wisdom, light, determining the harmony of all forces, each idea, force, form of things was allowed to work itself out as far as it could in the mass of infinite possibilities by its separate will and inevitably in the end by conflict with others. Division, ego, the imperfect consciousness and groping and struggle of a separate self-affirmation are the effective cause of the suffering and ignorance of this world. Once consciousness separated from the one consciousness, they fell inevitably into ignorance. And the last result of ignorance was inconscience. From a dark, immense inconscient, this material world arises, and out of it a soul that by evolution is struggling into consciousness, attracted towards the hidden light, ascending, but still blindly, towards the lost divinity from which it came. So the passage identifies the original cause or reason for error, falsehood, and evil in the world. It's due to the separation of the individual ego from the one divine. The individual ego asserts its independence from the one follows its own will and desire instead of maintaining its unity with and dependence on the one divine. And as a result, necessarily comes into clash and disharmony with other forces and beings around it due to its loss of a unifying consciousness. 
Here, Sri Aurobindo also explains that this separation in consciousness from the one divine resulted in a fall into ignorance and eventually inconscience, a complete lack of self-awareness. Though a hidden consciousness continues to act in that inconscient, but its action is hidden from the inconscient surface of existence. Out of the inconscient, our world emerged and has gradually evolved towards the hidden light or consciousness, the divinity from which it came. Now I'll skip ahead one paragraph and continue reading. But still, what is the purpose and origin of the disharmony? Why came this division and ego, this world of a painful evolution? Why must this evil and sorrow enter into the divine good, bliss, and peace? It's hard to answer to the human intelligence on its own level, for the consciousness to which the origin of this phenomenon belongs and to which it stands, as it were, automatically justified in a supra-intellectual knowledge is a cosmic and not an individualized human intelligence. It sees in larger spaces. It has another vision and cognition, other terms of consciousness than human reason and feeling. To the human mind, one might answer that while in itself the infinite might be free from these perturbations, yet once manifestation began, infinite possibility also began. And among the infinite possibilities, which it is the function of the universal manifestation to work out, the negation, the apparent effective negation with all its consequences of the power, light, peace, bliss, was very evidently one. So this passage deals with the question of the why, why error, falsehood, and evil should have come into existence and why they were allowed to come into being. Sri Aurobindo explains that once the manifestation of the infinite possibilities inherent in absolute being began, one of these possibilities was the effective negation with all its consequences of the power, light, peace, and bliss of the divine. It is this possibility of the divine that has manifested here at the origin of our material world, manifested as inconscient physical energy and matter. Sri Aurobindo continues, if it is asked why, even if possible, it should have been accepted, the answer nearest to the cosmic truth which the human intelligence can make is that in the relations or in the transition of the divine in the oneness to the divine in the many, this ominous possible became at a certain point inevitable. For once it appears it acquires for the soul descending into evolutionary manifestation an irresistible attraction which creates the inevitability. An attraction which in human terms on the terrestrial level might be interpreted as the call of the unknown, the joy of danger and difficulty and adventure the will to attempt the impossible, to work out the incalculable, the will to create the new and uncreated with one's own self and life as the material, the fascination of contradictions and their difficult harmonization. These things translated into another supraphysical, superhuman consciousness higher and wider than the mental, were the temptation that led to the fall. 
For to the original being of light on the verge of descent, the one thing unknown was the depths of the abyss, the possibilities of the divine in the ignorance and in conscience. So here Sri Aurobindo gives us more directly the reason for the fall, that it presented an irresistible attraction for the soul descending into manifestation. For it was something unknown, presented a fascinating possibility of the joy of danger, difficulty, and adventure. And the passage continues. On the other side, from the divine oneness, a vast acquiescence, compassionate, consenting, helpful, a supreme knowledge that this thing must be, that having appeared, it must be worked out, that its appearance is in a certain sense part of the incalculable infinite wisdom that if the plunge into night was inevitable, the emergence into a new unprecedented day was also a certitude, and that only so could a certain manifestation of the supreme truth be effected. By a working out with its phenomenal opposites as the starting point of the evolution, as the condition laid down for a transforming emergence. In this acquiescence was embraced, too, the will of the great sacrifice, the descent of the divine itself into the inconscience to take up the burden of the ignorance and its consequences, to intervene as the avatar and the viputi walking between the double sign of the cross and the victory towards the fulfillment and deliverance. A two-imaged rendering of the inexpressible truth, but without images how to present to the intellect a mystery far beyond it. It is only when one has crossed the barrier of the limited intelligence and shared in the cosmic experience and knowledge which sees things from identity, that the supreme realities which lie behind these images, images corresponding to the terrestrial fact, assume their divine forms and are felt as simple, natural, implied in the essence of things. It is by entering into that greater consciousness alone that one can grasp the inevitability of its self-creation and its purpose. So Sri Aurobindo tells us that the divine consciousness consented to this attraction of the soul for this adventure into ignorance and inconscience and its slow evolutionary emergence from it, understanding that it had a place in the infinite wisdom. At the same time, it embraced, too, the plunge of its own being and consciousness into the abyss to intervene as the avatar and viputi, to lead the evolutionary ascent out of the darkness and into reunification with the divine consciousness. Next, I'll read a passage from The Life Divine, page 625 which gives us an insight into the nature of error, falsehood, and evil, and in particular, to the personal side of these forces, the beings behind these forces. He says, as there are powers of knowledge or forces of the light, so there are powers of ignorance and tenebrous forces of the darkness whose work is to prolong the reign of ignorance and inconscience. As there are forces of truth, so there are forces that live by the falsehood and support it and work for its victory. As there are powers whose life is intimately bound up with the existence 
the idea and the impulse of good. So there are forces whose life is bound up with the existence and the idea and the impulse of evil. It is this truth of the cosmic invisible that was symbolized in the ancient belief of a struggle between the powers of light and darkness, good and evil, for the possession of the world and the government of the life of man. This was the significance of the contest between the Vedic gods and their opponents, sons of darkness and division, figured in a later tradition as titan and giant and demon, asura, rakshasa, pisasha. The same tradition is found in the Zoroastrian double principle and the later Semitic opposition of God and his angels on the one side and Satan and his hosts on the other. Invisible personalities and powers that draw man to the divine light and truth and good or lure him into subjection to the undivine principle of darkness and falsehood and evil. So here Sri Aurobindo identifies more directly the existence not only of ignorance and inconscient at the base of the evolving world and their resulting error, but also of the presence of falsehood and evil. He presents them in terms of powers and forces, even as conscious powers that strive for the possession of the world and the control over the life of man. They're presented as in a struggle with the forces of truth, light, and goodness. The duality of these two sets of forces makes us think of Sri Aurobindo's earlier mention that one of the infinite possibilities in the divine was the effective negation with all its consequences of the power, light, peace, bliss of the divine together with the descent of the divine into the inconscience to lead the manifestation back to the divine. The next passage, which I'll break into three parts and comment on each, gives us a better sense of the evolutionary processes leading to error, falsehood, and evil, and especially the necessity and role of the egoistic self. It comes from the Life Divine, beginning on page 646. This then is the origin and nature of error, falsehood, wrong, and evil in the consciousness and will of the individual. A limited consciousness growing out of nescience is the source of error. A personal attachment to the limitation and the error born of it, the source of falsity, a wrong consciousness governed by the life ego, the source of evil. But it is evident that their relative existence is only a phenomenon thrown up by the cosmic force in its drive towards evolutionary self-expression. And it is there that we have to look for the significance of the phenomenon. For the emergence of the life ego is, as we have seen, a machinery of cosmic nature for the affirmation of the individual, for his self-disengagement from the indeterminate mass substance of the subconscient, for the appearance of a conscious being on a ground prepared by the inconscience. The principle of life affirmation of the ego is the necessary consequence. So he gives in very concise terms the origin and nature of error, falsehood, and evil in the individual. Error is born from a limiting consciousness emerging out of the nescience of matter Falsehood arises due to attachment to limitation and error. 
and evil arises due to a wrong consciousness governed by the life ego. And I think it's fair to say that the ego is at the source of all three. The separation of the one divine consciousness in a limited conscious ego, asserting its separate independence in the world. Here, Sri Aurobindo describes more fully the nature of this ego. He says it is the machinery of the cosmic nature for the affirmation of the individual, for his self-disengagement from the indeterminate mass of the subconscious. Once there was the plunge into the inconscient, which is indeterminate, that is, it's not individualized, not clearly demarcated. The only way out of this inconscient substratum of existence was through the development of an ignorant, limited sense of individuality, a constructed individuality, and this is the ego. This ego asserting its place and independence against the world around it and the other beings in that world is at the heart of error, falsehood, and evil. The passage continues. The individual ego is a pragmatic and effective fiction, a translation of the secret self into the terms of surface consciousness or a subjective substitute for the true self in our surface experience. It is separated by ignorance from other self and from the inner divinity, but it is still pushed secretly towards an evolutionary unification in diversity. It has behind itself, though finite, the impulse to the infinite, but this, in the terms of an ignorant consciousness, translates itself into the will to expand, to be a boundless finite, to take everything it can into itself, to enter into everything and possess it, or even to be possessed by it if it can feel itself satisfied or growing in or through others, or can take into itself by subjection, the being and power of others, or get thereby a help or an impulse for its self-affirmation, its life delight, its enrichment of its mental, vital, or physical existence. So here, Sri Aurobindo explains what the ego is, a pragmatic and effective fiction a subjective substitute for the true self in our surface experience. It's separated by ignorance from other self and from the inner divinity. So we base our experience of life on the ego, but it is not our true self. Our true self, of which we are unaware, knows and feels its oneness with the divine and with others. But the ego is a temporary self that is constructed to support our evolution and growth through the ignorance, like a scaffolding to help us differentiate our consciousness from the surrounding mass consciousness so that it may develop more rapidly. As the ego develops, because it is ignorant and based on a sense of separateness from everything else, it tries to take into itself everything or to enter into everything else in order to possess it. So this necessarily brings it into conflict with other egos and with its environment. The passage continues. But because it does these things as a separate ego for its separate advantage and not by conscious interchange and mutuality, not by unity, life discord, conflict, disharmony arise. 
And it is the products of this life discord and disharmony that we call wrong and evil. Nature accepts them because they are necessary circumstances of the evolution, necessary for the growth of the divided being. They are products of ignorance, supported by an ignorant consciousness that founds itself on division, by an ignorant will that works through division, by an ignorant delight of existence that takes the joy of division. So this shows again that the ego, the sense of being an individual separate from others and the world and the divine, is at the source, at the base of error, falsehood, and evil. Nature accepts it as a necessity of the evolution which begins from inconscient matter and proceeds through ignorance towards the divine. When its utility is over, then it will be dissolved and the true self will take its place. The next passage discusses the utility of our sense of sin, of sin and evil. The moral distinction we make classifying some actions as sinful or evil. This sense of sin and evil is absent in animal life. And while animals have pain and suffering, conflict, aggression, and even cruelty, there is not this accompanying sense of wrong or evil. This comes only at the human stage. Moreover, in the developed mentality, the detached reason can look at all things that occur in nature as an observant witness with a neutral impartiality without making moral judgments on the cosmic energy. There is also a higher spiritual consciousness in which such moral distinctions do not exist. So while this moral sense of evil is not universal, Sri Aurobindo argues that there may still be a reality and necessity and utility for the distinction between good and evil for the evolving human being. So the passage is from The Life Divine, beginning on page 632, and I'll break it into several parts, commenting on each. It may be maintained that the one use of the sense of sin and evil is that the embodied being may become aware of the nature of this world of inconscience and ignorance, awake to a knowledge of its evil and suffering and the relative nature of its good and happiness, and turn away from it to that which is absolute or else its spiritual use may be to purify the nature by the pursuit of good and the negation of evil until it is ready to perceive the supreme good and turn from the world towards God, or as in the Buddhistic ethical insistence, it may serve to prepare the dissolution of the ignorant ego complex and the escape from personality and suffering. But also it may be that this awakening is a spiritual necessity of the evolution itself, a step towards the growth of the being out of the ignorance into the truth of the divine unity and the evolution of a divine consciousness and a divine being. So in effect, although it may be a mind-constructed distinction and not an ultimate reality, the sense of sin and evil may be helpful to grow out of the ignorance, out of the sense of division, and lead us to seek for truth and unity. It develops in us a repugnance and aversion towards those actions which harden or lock us more tightly in our limited ego. 
The passage continues. For much more than the mind or life, which can turn either to good or to evil, it is the soul personality, the psychic being, which insists on the distinction, though in a larger sense than the mere moral difference. It is the soul in us which turns always towards truth and good and beauty, because it is by these things that it itself grows in stature. The rest, their opposites, are a necessary part of, the, of experience, but have to be outgrown in the spiritual increase of the being. The fundamental psychic entity in us has the delight of life and all experience as part of the progressive manifestation of the spirit. But the very principle of its delight of life is to gather out of all contacts and happenings their secret divine sense and essence, a divine use and purpose, so that by experience our mind and life may grow out of the inconscience towards the supreme consciousness, out of the divisions of the ignorance towards an integralizing consciousness and knowledge. It is there for that, and it pursues from life to life its ever-increasing upward tendency and insistence. The growth of the soul is a growth out of darkness into light, out of falsehood into truth, out of suffering into its own supreme and universal ananda. So Sri Aurobindo suggests that the sense of evil may derive from our soul or psychic being whose function is to lead us through the ignorance and error and conflict of the human evolution towards a higher divine life where these things are overpassed. Whereas falsehood and evil may be a necessary stage through which the human nature must pass in its evolutionary ascent and therefore in a sense are justified, yet the function of the soul is to lead us through and out of this lower stage of our evolution to a stage where truth, goodness, and beauty are the natural and spontaneous condition of the being. Therefore, the moral sense of the distinction between good and evil may derive from the soul's natural inclination towards these higher divine states and its turn away from their opposites. He continues, the soul's perception of good and evil may not coincide with the mind's artificial standards, but it has a deeper sense, a sure discrimination of what points to the higher light and what points away from it. It is true that as the inferior light is below good and evil, so the superior spiritual light is beyond good and evil. But this is not in the sense of admitting all things with an impartial neutrality or of obeying equally the impulses of good and evil but in the sense that a higher law of being intervenes in which there is no longer any place or utility for these values. There is a self-law of supreme truth which is above all standards. There is a supreme and universal good, inherent, intrinsic, self-existent, self-aware, self-moved and determined infinitely plastic with the pure plasticity of the luminous consciousness of the supreme infinite. Sri Aurobindo acknowledges that the soul's perception of good and evil may not be the same as the mind's artificial standards, but nevertheless the mind's inclination to make the moral distinction may derive from the soul's discrimination. Thus, even the moral distinction made by our mind 
may be a useful and necessary stage in our development out of the ignorance of the lower nature. Now let us look at how Sri Aurobindo describes and explains the presence of error, falsehood, and evil in Savitri. Indeed, this is the primary theme of the epic as a whole, and there are relevant passages in many parts of the poem. Of course, the main theme of the poem is Savitri's conquest of death in her effort to retrieve her husband, Satyavan, from death's grasp. But death in the poem represents more than physical death. He also represents the darkness of inconscience and the limitation, pain, suffering, falsehood, and evil that spring from it. This becomes evident as Savitri follows the god death into the black void and in her long debate with him. But some of the richest Passages about error, falsehood, and evil come in the canto called The Way of Fate and the Problem of Pain, in which the heavenly sage Narad explains the place and purpose of these aspects of existence to Savitri's parents after he discloses to them Satyavan's fate of death in just one year's time after his marriage with their daughter. So this first passage comes from that canto on pages 447 to 448. A dark, concealed hostility is lodged in the human depths, in the hidden heart of time, that claims the right to change and mar God's work. A secret enmity ambushes the world's march it leaves a mark on thought and speech and act. It stamps stain and defect on all things done till it is slain. Peace on, peace is forbidden on earth. There is no visible foe, but the unseen is round us. Forces intangible besiege, touches, from alien realms, thoughts not our own overtake us and compel the erring heart. Our lives are caught in an ambiguous net. An adversary force was born of old, invader of the life of mortal man. It hides from him the straight, immortal path. A power came in to veil the eternal light. A power opposed to the eternal will diverts the messages of the infallible word, contorts the contours of the cosmic plan. A whisper lures to evil the human heart. It seals up wisdom's eyes, the soul's regard. It is the origin of our suffering here. It binds earth to calamity and pain. This all must conquer who would bring down God's peace. This hidden foe lodged in the human breast, man must overcome or miss his higher fate. This is the inner war without escape. The passage describes the origin and effect of error, falsehood, and evil in human life, attributing these things to an adversary force that was born of old. Indeed, the prose writings other prose writing suggested it is as old as the material universe itself. Its force is a powerful and conscious force. Here it's described as a concealed hostility opposed to the eternal will, hiding from man the straight immortal path, diverting the messages of the infallible word. 
luring to evil the human heart and binding earth to calamity and pain. He plainly says, it is the origin of our suffering here. And we're told that we must overcome this foe lodged in the human breast or miss our higher fate. That this is the inner war without escape. Another canto that gives a penetrating insight into the phenomena of falsehood and evil is called the Descent into Night, which recounts King Asopati's journey into the subtle planes of existence, near to the inconscient base of existence, in his search to find the cause of Earth's ignorance, pain, and suffering. The next long passage I'll read comes from that canto, and I'll break it into smaller parts and briefly comment on each. It starts on page 202. The veil was rent that covers nature's depths. He saw the fount of the world's lasting pain and the mouth of the black pit of ignorance. The evil guarded at the roots of life raised up its head and looked into his eyes. On a dim bank where dies subjective space, from a stark ridge overlooking all that is, a tenebrous awakened nescience, her wide blank eyes wondering at time and form, stared at the inventions of the living void and the abyss whence our beginnings rose. Behind appeared a gray carved mask of night, watching the birth of all created things. A hidden puissance, conscious of its force, a vague and lurking presence everywhere, a contrary doom that threatens all things made, a death figuring as the dark seed of life, seem to engender and to slay the world. So King Asopati looks deep down into the darkness near the abyss whence our beginnings rose and sees there a living being, a tenebrous awakened nescience. It is observing time and form, the inventions of the living void with its wide blank eyes from a stark ridge overlooking all that is. It is described as a contrary doom that threatens all things made, as a death figuring as the dark seed of life, the fount of the world's lasting pain, the mouth of the black pit of ignorance, and the evil guarded at the roots of life. The passage continues. Then, from the somber mystery of the gulfs and from the hollow bosom of the mask, something crept forth that seemed a shapeless thought, a fatal influence upon creatures stole, whose lethal touch pursued the immortal spirit on life was laid the haunting finger of death, and overcast with error, grief, and pain, the soul's native will for truth and joy and light. A deformation coiled that claimed to be the being's very turn, nature's true drive a hostile and perverting mind at work in every corner ensconced of conscious life, corrupted truth with their own formulas, 
interceptor of the listening of the soul, afflicting knowledge with the hue of doubt. It captured the oracles of the occult gods, effaced the signposts of life's pilgrimage, canceled the firm rock edicts graved by time, and on the foundations of the cosmic law erected its bronze pylons of misrule. So out of this being issued forth a shapeless thought, a fatal influence, the haunting finger of death, and it overcast with air, grief, and pain, the soul's native will for truth and joy and light. It was a hostile and perverting mind that entrenched itself in every corner of conscious life and corrupted truth. Passage continues, even light and love by that cloaked danger spell turned from the brilliant nature of the gods to fallen angels and misleading sons became themselves a danger and a charm, a perverse sweetness, heaven-born malefice. Its power could deform divinest things. A wind of sorrow breathed upon the world. All thought with falsehood was besieged. All act stamped with defect or with frustration sign. All high attempt with failure or vain success. But none could know the reason of his fall. The gray mask whispered and Though no sound was heard, yet in the ignorant heart a seed was sown that bore black fruit of suffering, death, and bale. Out of the chill steps of a bleak unseen, invisible, wearing the night's gray mask, arrive the shadowy, dreadful messengers invaders from a dangerous world of power, ambassadors of evils absolute. In silence, the inaudible voices spoke, hands that none saw planted the fatal grain. No form was seen, yet a dire work was done. An iron decree in crooked unseals written imposed a law of sin and adverse fate. So this dark influence could deform divinest things. All was surrounded and attacked by falsehood. All high attempt turned into failure or a meaningless success. Its whisper sowed a bad seed in the ignorant heart that led to suffering, death, and disaster. And its messengers, ambassadors of evil's absolute, secretly carried out their terrible work and imposed a law of sin and adverse fate on living creatures. Passage continues. Life looked at him with changed and somber eyes. Her beauty he saw and the yearning heart in things that with a little happiness is content, answering to a small ray of truth or love. He saw her gold sunlight and her far blue sky her green of leaves and hue and scent of flowers. 
and the charm of children and the love of friends and the beauty of women and kindly hearts of men, but saw, too, the dreadful powers that drive her moods and the anguish she has strewn upon her ways, fate waiting on the unseen steps of men and her evil and sorrow and last gift of death. A breath of dissolution and decadence, corrupting, watched for life's maturity and made to rot the full grain of the soul. Progress became a purveyor of death, a world that clung to a law of a slain light, cherished the putrid corpses of dead truths, hail twisted forms, as things free, new, and true. Beauty from ugliness and evil drank, feeling themselves guests at a banquet of the gods, and tasted corruption like a high-spiced food. Here, Sri Aurobindo contrasts the kind of life that might have been if it were not for these hostile forces with the kind of light that it has become, with their deforming influences. He mentions life's gold sunlight and her far blue sky, her green of leaves and hue and scent of flowers, and the charm of children and the love of friends, and the beauty of women and kindly hearts of men. Of course, we see this positive side of life in the world also, but unfortunately, it is very often interrupted, corrupted, distorted, trampled on, or cut short due to the adverse forces. The passage continues. A darkness settled on the heavy air. It hunted the bright smile from nature's lips and slew the native confidence in her heart and put fear's crooked look into her eyes. The lust that warps the spirit's natural good replaced by a manufactured virtue and vice. The frank, spontaneous impulse of the soul Afflicting nature with the duel's lie, their twin values wedded a forbidden zest, made evil a relief from spurious good. The ego battened on righteousness and sin, and each became an instrument of hell. In rejected heaps by a monotonous road, the old simple delights were left to die, no, were left to lie on the wasteland of life's descent to night. All glory of life was dimmed, tarnished with doubt. All beauty ended in an aging face. All power was dubbed a tyranny cursed by God, and truth of fiction needed by the mind. The chase of joy was now a tired hunt. All knowledge was left a questioning ignorance. So this part of the passage describes some of the primary distortion that this falsehood makes in life the bright smile and happiness of life and its native confidence are destroyed and substituted with fear's crooked look. The spirit's natural good, the frank spontaneous impulse of the soul are warped by lust and misplaced by a manufactured virtue and vice. 
Beauty ends in an aging face. Power is called a tyranny, cursed by God, and truth is called a fiction, needed by the mind. All knowledge becomes a questioning ignorance and the seeking for joy and exhausting pursuit. In the next passage, we're given a few hints regarding the utility of the dark forces in the overall scheme of existence, and finally to the solution to them and their end. It comes from Book 1, Canto 2, called The Issue, which describes the main predicament facing Savitri and her mission. It comes on pages 18 and 19. In this enigma of the dusk of God, this slow and strange, uneasy compromise of limiting nature with a limitless soul, where all must move between an ordered chance and an uncaring, blind necessity, too high the fire spiritual dare not blaze. If once it met the intense original flame, an answering touch might shatter all measures made and earth sink down with the weight of the infinite. A jail is this immense material world. Across each road stands armed a stone-eyed law at every gate the huge, dim sentinel's pace, a gray tribunal of the ignorance, an inquisition of the priests of night, in judgment sit on the adventurer soul. And the dual tables and the karmic norm restrain the titan in us and the god. Pain with its lash, joy with its silver bribe, guard the wheels circling immobility. A bond is put on the high climbing mind, a seal on the too large wide open heart. Death stays the journeying discoverer life. Thus is the throne of the inconscient safe, while the tardy coilings of the eons pass and the animal browses in the sacred fence and the gold hawk can cross the skies no more. But one stood up and lit the limitless flame arraigned by the dark power that hates all bliss in the dire court where life must pay for joy, sentenced by the mechanic justicer to the afflicting penalty of man's hopes, her head she bowed not to the stark decree, bearing her helpless heart to destiny's stroke, so bows and must the mind born will in man, obedient to the statutes fixed of old, admitting without appeal the nether gods. In her, the superhuman cast its seed. So the first lines describe the intermediate and provisional character of our world, situated in the dusk of God, a twilight zone between the absolute light and absolute darkness, in an uneasy compromise between a limiting nature and a limitless soul. All moves here between an ordered chance and an uncaring blind necessity. It's interesting to speculate why Sri Aurobindo says this. Chance seems to imply a kind of freedom, 
and uncertainty about which outcome will ensue, which in the context of our lives could mean a certain freedom of choice. These characteristics seem to be associated with the limitless soul. On the other hand, a blind, uncaring necessity seems to imply that things happen according to a predetermined plan, a set of laws that are inherent in nature. These necessities then are associated with a limiting nature. Our life is a compromise, an uneasy compromise between these two aspects. In this situation, too high the fire spiritual dare not blaze. In other words, constraints are put upon the soul so that it does not disrupt or destroy the processes and progressive evolution of nature. At the same time, we see that at the base of nature is the inconscient, and from out of the inconscient have arisen the dark power that hates all bliss, the priests of night that in judgment sit upon the adventurer soul and the dim sentinels that guard each gate of exit to prevent escape or too far in advance. These are the adverse forces, and at least part of their justification or utility is that they keep the throne of the inconscient safe while the tardy coilings of the eons pass. In other words, they maintain the laws of nature through the ages. What then is the solution? Savitri, the Divine Mother, in whom the superhuman cast its seed, comes to intervene and change the stark decree, the statutes fixed of old. She stood up and lit the limitless flame. She comes to defeat the adverse forces and to change the laws governing the world from those of the inconscient to those of the divine. It is only the avatar, the incarnate divine, who can do this. Until a new foundation is built, a supramental foundation, the old inconscient foundation cannot be undone. And the supramental foundation could not be built until the evolution of nature had proceeded far enough. So this the mother and Sri Aurobindo claim to have done. They established the supermind as a governing principle in the earth consciousness. Though it is perhaps not yet in full control of the world, or perhaps it is allowing the falsehood to continue until the evolution proceeds further. They also work to convert or defeat the Asuric forces that have ruled over the earth nature. In this latter endeavor, it appears from what the mother has said that their success was partial. As she explained that one powerful Asura, the lord of falsehood, refused to be converted and promised to sow as much destruction as possible until the transformation comes. Whatever be the exact status of our world and its evolution to the supramental creation, it's clear that the work is not finished, that falsehood still reigns strongly here, and that ignorance and evil remain. The mother has indicated that having established the supermind here on earth, eventually it would prevail over the falsehood and transform life. But in the meantime, how are we to cope with the continued presence of the adverse forces? Clearly, the best thing that we can do is to follow as well as we can the path that Sri Aurobindo and the mother have shown to us 
But they have also said that the hostile forces are keen to attack all those who pursue their path and to stop or to delay their progress as much as possible. How are we to respond to this threat? This is addressed in the last quote I'll read from the canto, The Descent into Night, pages 210 to 11. Here must the traveler of the upward way, for daring hell's kingdoms, winds the heavenly route, pause or pass slowly through that perilous space, a prayer upon his lips and the great name. If probe not all discernment's keen spear point, he might stumble into falsity's endless net. Over his shoulder often he must look back, like one who feels on his neck an enemy's breath, else stealing up behind a treasonous blow might prostrate cast and pin to unholy soil, pierce through his back by evil's poignant stake. So might one fall on the eternal's road, forfeiting the spirit's lonely chance in time, and no news of him reach the waiting gods, marked missing in the register of souls, his name the index of a failing hope, the position of a dead remembered star. Only were safe who kept God in their hearts, courage their armor, faith their sword, they must walk, the hand ready to smite, the eye to scout, casting a javelin regard in front, heroes and soldiers of the army of light. Now we see that the path of integral yoga is a difficult and dangerous route because those who follow this path are attempting a transformation of the darkness that lies at the roots of our existence. We must walk through dark, dangerous corridors and face adverse forces, which are deceptive and stealthily attack all who attempt it. Of course, we have the protection of Sri Aurobindo and the Mother, but still, to pass through this ordeal, we must be careful, faithful, resolute, and courageous. Sri Aurobindo gives a few important suggestions to the sadhak to keep a prayer upon his lips and the great name. Over his shoulder often he must look back like one who feels on his neck an enemy's breath and only were safe who kept God in their hearts. Courage, their armor, faith, their sword, they must walk, the hand ready to smite, the eye to scout, casting a javelin regard in front, heroes and soldiers of the army of light. So. Thank you.